So the next session is going to be about uh, uh, biorefinery and the biorefinery concept. What else we can make from biomass uh, apart from biofuels and, and bioenergy? And we are going to have a, a broader focus on biochemicals and biomaterials. Our first speaker is going to be from the industry, uh, Boregord. Uh, and later we will have three research presentations from universities. So uh, I would like to welcome here on this st stage the technology director of Boregord, Gudbrand Rödsrud. Uh, thank you very much for accepting uh, the chance to talk uh, here with us. And he is going to talk about uh, Boregord's perspective on uh, uh, biorefining. Good. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for inviting me. Though I'm not always agree with all your viewpoints, so today I thought I should be a bit provocative. I normally give presentations when I'm very positive and give a lot of, of um, potentials. Today I'm going to change that a little bit. So here. This is an, a recent overview of all the bioethanol projects, second generation or advanced biofuel project in the world. And if you look at them, there is very few that's actually operational. This is quite depressing. And there are two in Brazil and one in the US. Borgard is up there, but we're not producing cellulosic ethanol. We're producing ethanol from hemicellulose, so it shouldn't be on the list. Um, and the reason why these three are actually still in operation is not because they haven't had any, have any problems. It's because there are huge companies that intend to use the technology themselves. So they can actually benefit from solving the problems, even though it's, ha it's going on for three or four years. And they have the power to do it. So it's not that easy as we thought. Uh, and it might also be that the profitability is an issue here, of course. On the graph up to the right, this is a, a, a statistics that is given out every month, actually. It's updated until March this year, and it gives the production of advanced bioethanol in US. And the blue staples is the actual production. The green is the, uh, is the import. The orange stapled line is Borgard's production capacity. And if you look at the capacity here, the capacity should be much higher than Borgard's. So that means these plants, at the, this one, is not even producing up to capacity. So I've heard others actually claiming this ethanol production is the boulevard of broken dreams for the ones who know music. Borgard. We are turning all parts of wood into, uh, into products and into chemicals. We're not producing cellulose for pulp. We are, producing, we are a pulping company. So we do pulp wood, and but we produce only chemicals. So our cellulose is sold on molecular weight and purity as a chemical, and it's going into chemical industry, converted into ethers and acetates. This is the upper part here. This is the Borgard plant in Sarsborg, where, which is claimed to be the world's ad most advanced biorefinery. We also have a new line of uh, Exilva, microfibrillated cellulose. I'll show some of the, this later on. We're still the largest producer of wood-based bioethanol. We shouldn't be, because we're not, we haven't increased capacity in the last 50 years, but still we are. We're the only producer of Vandlin from wood, and we are the only producer, I'm sorry, not the only, but we are the largest producer of lignin in the world. We also have uh, other uh, lignin operations worldwide, where we buy the cooking liquor from other pulping companies and convert it into performance chemicals. These external sulfite mills, we only take cooking liquor from sulfite mills. They are often competitors on the, on the cellulose side. But still, we often operate the, the lignin operation in joint ventures. Like the new plant in Florida, it just opened a year ago, one and a half year ago. Beside that, we also have a purely synthetic operation, where we produce intermediates for pharmaceutical industry. That means we have excellent setup to explore bioactive, 
pharmaceutical components from wood and biomass as well, because we, we run this operation already. And we do have the equipment, and we do have the procedures which is needed, the CGMP. So, Borgard in, uh, in figures, we're not that big a company, a bit more than 1,000 employees. Maersk is 80,000 plus. So uh, this is just a small, small little company. We operate, the green triangles are where we have production units, and every production unit outside Norway is, is uh, ligand in operations. Around 500 million euros in uh, turnover, production in seven countries. We're very high, have a very high intensity in, in R&D and innovation. We spend more than 5% lit up and down, but around 5% uh, of the turnover on the innovation. For pulping companies, they normally are, normally are less than a tenth of this. So we operate more like a specialty chemical company. Uh, we just happen to have wood as a, as a feedstock. Now, I'm going to give so a few examples of new potential technologies and products. Um, so we have developed a new process, pretreatment and separation process to co-produce sugars and lignin. And the whole idea is to process biomass so we can actually turn the lignin part into high value products. Almost every other pretreatment process, they destroy the lignin in the first step. If you have a peak temperature above 190 degrees, then you probably destroy your lignin. Most steam explosion processes do that. It's condensed, lignin is condensed. They lose all their reactive sites. You can't dissolve it in anything. You can't do chemistry on it. So the only solution then is to burn it. But Borgard see the growth opportunity in the lignin business. Actually, we see more growth opportunities in lignin than in cellulose. So we want to have more feedstock of lignin, and there is no more free feedstock for us in the, in the world. So if we're gonna grow in the lignin business, we actually need to produce our own feedstock. This is what we do in the Bali plant. So since we're not gonna produce cellulose, we hydrolyze the cellulose to sugars, and from the sugars, we can produce biochemicals. The sugars. We now have, pr have developed three different qualities of sugars. This is cellulose hydrolysates, three different purities. This is a standard which comes out of the hydrolysis reactor. We can purify it into two better, better or higher purity sugar products. Uh, you see some specifications here. Almost every fermentation process can actually use this brown stuff. It's more than good enough. It do does not contain in any um, inhibitors. So these processes do not produce inhibitors for fermentation either, either. For the ones who need more purity, we also can do that. And we deliver tons of samples to a lot of companies who has been running this uh, for several years, actually. Uh, this demo plant, we have stopped running it now because it's ready for, for investment in full scale. We don't need to, to improve the process. When we decide on the site to, to build a plant, we will run it, just adapt to the specific local feedstock. Another one, another product. This is the Exilva, that's a microfibrillator cellulose. These pictures are at the same magnification. This is a human hair. These are traditional cellulose fibers. This is what we do when we defibrillate the, the, the fibers. And this, these fibers are still crystalline, they're not water soluble, but they can be dispersed in water. They have extreme high surface and they form a network, a continuous network, which gives a lot of very interesting pro properties. We are selling products now. This is a commercial production. The total capacity is not large, but we have a capacity of 1,000 tons a year. Uh, the, the plant can easily expand to the double, and we are working on marketing and developing application areas for these products. Some, uh, uh, some uh, examples of which type of industries. 
This is only going to industry, not to fruit application. Uh, these are the two qualities we deliver today. We deliver it as a 2% dispersion. This is a thick paste. You can turn a beaker upside down, it won't drop out. 2%, 98% to water. This is 10% paste. It's a rubbery ball. Still 90% water. But it can be pumped. Even this one can be pumped because it's so extremely shear thinning. So once you start to, to actually put on shear forces, it will flow. Very interesting in, in a few of these applications, like adhesives and coatings, for instance. Agchem, very interesting uh, application, where it actually improves the performance of, of um, pesticide actives. So you can reduce the concentration of the pesticide actives in the formulations. This is a, a commercial application as well, where it actually improves the, the strength of corrugated boards and improves the speed of the production line. And in addition to that, it can actually remove the boron, which is a problem in this. Boron is a health uh, issue. So a lot of interesting areas. And potential customers come to us almost every day with new ideas and new applications we wouldn't even dream of. It's quite an interesting area. This is another cellulose-based product. It's a defibrillated cellulose. It's a totally different technology. We're producing this in the US. This is also semi-commercial. This is a small plant. It's going into food as a fat replacer. And it actually gives the same mouthfeel as full-fat products. Normally, low-fat products feels watery. But using this, it, f it, uh, it has the same taste as, as full-fat products. Very interesting product as well. Very different application, just an example again. Uh, I can't show you all the new applications because we're working on so many interesting, but this is an environmentally friendly issue. It's a company called Crusher International. They have developed this technology using our lignin pro product, one of our lignin products. We do have more than 250 different chemical products out of lignin. So actually, when you need to put on new asphalt on the road, the way we do it today, we take away the old one, and this one is actually dumped, transported and dumped. Then they put on the new asphalt. What they do, they grind it on site, blend it with the lignin binder and compact it and you have a new road. This is all done on site and recirculating the asphalt. Beautiful. Now, in the future, we believe that lignin will be the source of aromatics in the future. We haven't found anyone who has actually have a really functioning technology yet. But I'm sorry to bother you with some chemistry here, but uh, I'm a chemist, I, I can't give a presentation without at least one slide with chemistry on. So this is a lignin molecule, and we put in the, the um, binding strength of the different bonds here. And if you look at this, and compare to the bond strength of the aromatic ring, which is about, uh, didn't I put it, yeah, 500 to 650 kilojoule per mole. These bonds in between the rings are substantially weaker. So it should be possible to find a way to break only the bonds between the rings without destroying the phenolic rings or aromatic rings. We just f need to find a way to do it and control it. And so we're looking for technologies doing this we found a few we believe in, it's not proven. Uh, and the main problem today is that none of the technologies out there have enough yield. Typically yields below 10%. We already today, we produce vanillin from lignin, breaking down this stru structure. Vanillin is, is a monomer like this. The yield is very low, but the side stream also is valuable. So that makes that Profit, profitable, the whole process. But as production of monomer, it's not. So we need to find better ways of doing it. 
I hope someone will come up with a technology. We, we're testing out a few. Uh, we hope it will work, but I'm not sure it is going to be the solution. Um, now, some, some principle, which probably will provoke you a bit. I believe that biomass is going to be not a plentiful resource in the future. If we look at the volume of oil and fossil resources we're using, available biomass is very small. It can't replace all the oil. Ma majority of oil is going to energy production, stationary energy, heat and power. That can be replaced by other, other um, sustainable energy sources. So this is the lower part here. And also transportation for smaller cars could be electrified, and we don't need to use the biomass. There are some areas where, where the carbon in the fossil fuel is the thing, not, not the energy. Like in chemicals, plastics, so on. You, if you're going to replace this, you need to replace it with green carbon. We we'll at least need to place the biocarbon in that segment. Then we have some transportation fuel for long distance, heavy trucks, aviation, which will probably not be totally replaced by electrifying, for instance, for quite long. So there we need some, some fuel with high energy density. That's also where we need to put the, um, the um, biocarbon. So I hope policymakers also will understand this. I've shown this one to, to EU a couple of times when I tell them uh, how we are thinking when we produce products from biomass. This, this is a more well-known uh, participation of, of, of feedstock. This is, is, um, is an ox or a cow. Normally, we part it into very high number of valuable products. No one would e even dream of taking the, 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 the um, filet and make sausages and make dog food of the rest of it. It won't be profitable. It's doable. Technologically, it's not, it's not hard to do at all. But it won't be in any profit. What do we do with biomass? We make low-value products out of the best part of it, then we burn the rest of it. That's not sustainable. So, my message to you, the only way to run this is to, to combine it, to produce high-value products like the oil refineries do, and the rest you can can source into energy and fuel. So, thank you. Thank you, Goodbrand. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with you, with the, the vision how to use uh, uh, biocarbon. Are there some questions from the audience? We've been waiting so long for Borogard's talk here. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Hello, I'm Andreas Seklund at Ecopar AB here in Gothenburg, making synthetic fuels and chemicals, mm -hmm. including the biosynthetic ones. I have noticed that from, for example, American research groups at NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, they have indeed converted lignin to uh, phenols, cresols, and aromatics, BTX, benzene, xylene, toluene. So it mm. seems to be possible. The yields were not that bad, as you said, 10%. It was higher. Do you have any comments? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very hard to, to actually to calculate the yield. Because often what they do, they take the, um, they take the analyze what, how much lignin is it in the feedstock. And they normally do it on, on biomass, not on the, on the pure lignin. And if you analyze that, taking the um, yeah, several methods to do it, you often, you often underestimate how much lignin is there. So, and then you calculate what yield you have, and if you, you measure your yield, and you compare that un to an underestimated um, amount of feedstock, you get a high percentage yield. Um, from what we've seen, it's not 
as high as they claim. So we looked into many of these, and we, we picked a few, and not the end rail ones, actually. Yeah, thank you, um, Jude Ondele from Austin. Um, is your valley lignin available for researchers to test? Yes, it is. Well, the barley lignin is actually made to copy the, the lignin we're producing today. So the barley lignin, we mostly produce larger amounts from spruce. We also we tested a lot of other biomasses, but uh, in larger volumes we, we produce from spruce. Um, and it's made to, to match what we produce in, in full scale today. So there won't be much difference. But so you can have everyone who actually asks for samples of the barley lignin, they, they receive samples of our existing production at, the, at their Sarsper site. Sorry, a, a follow up question. Do yeah. you envisage that your technology will replace the pulp and paper mill? Sorry, I didn't get that. You know, your Bali technology, yeah. will it in future replace the current technology in the paper and pulp industry for biomass? No, it's not, it's, it's not made for pulping because the way we run the process, we optimize the quality of the lignin and we don't give a damn in the quality of the cellulose. All other pulping companies, they, they really optimize the cellulose quality and they don't care about the lignin quality. We turn it upside down because we are only going to, to hydrolyze the cellulose afterwards. So we actually optimize it on the quality of the lignin and cost. So we speed up the process and we make sure the quality is excellent of the lignin. All right, thank you very much, Goodbrand. Please join me in thanking Goodbrand. <laughs> Uh, our next speaker is going to be Gunnar Larsson from uh, SLU, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, uh, using short-chain alcohols as fuels uh, to operate uh, uh, vehicles that run on land but uh, are not connected to transportation. So, Gunnar, the Thank floor you. is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I should mention that, uh, apart from me, uh, we are two people running this project. Uh, it's also a consultant called uh, Pedro with Passion. Um, and it is part of the research program Renewable uh, Transportation Fuels and Systems that is funded by the Swedish Energy Agency and uh, F3. <coughs> um, why do we want to investigate these things? Um, uh, one important reason is that um, uh, work machineries, like we are talking machineries in uh, agriculture, uh, forestry, uh, construction and so on, uh, it's actually quite a substantial part of the fuel use, uh, roughly 10% in, in Sweden. Uh, so it's very important what we, we do uh, in that sector, and it's a sector where uh, fossil fuels uh, Fossil diesel is virtually 100%. Uh, and we want to look at uh, alcohols, because that's something which, in this context, have not really been looked into that much. There are quite a lot of studies on biogas, biodiesels, and so on. Uh, we are looking at a different, uh, number of different uh, scenarios. Uh, we want to compare with something, so we compare with uh, fossil and renewable diesel produced here in Gothenburg. Uh, and we compare that with uh, production of uh, methanol from uh, forestry in uh, Munsterås. Uh, uh, with uh, production of uh, ethanol in North Shopping. Sorry, uh, that's uh, here, uh, and production of ethanol from forestry in 
in Domscha. Uh, up here. Um, and we look at uh, three use cases where we want to cover um, the big variety in, in the sector. Uh, so we're looking at uh, agriculture in the southern part of Sweden. Uh, we're looking at forestry in the northern part of Sweden. And we are looking at construction in the uh, Stockholm region, which is typically where most of these types of machinery uh, are used. Uh, and we are looking at the uh, size ranges where the, we have uh, the most uh, fuel consumption and, and, and um, uh, emissions. Uh, if we want to use uh, alcohols uh, for um, running vehicles, we have a, a number of options. Uh, one interesting alternative is to use it in diesel engines. Uh, now, alcohols, if you look at the fuel properties, uh, they're not really that great for, for diesel, so we have to do, do something about that. Uh, one th way is to start a bit small, to use it as a, uh, a blending with diesel. You can't add uh, that much, but you, you can add some. Uh, you can also use it as uh, dual fuel, then you would have diesel. Di diesel will start a uh, combustion process, and then you will add alcohols for much of the uh, energy use. Uh, and finally, you can add um, components that improve the, the so say, uh, diesel characteristics of uh, alcohols uh, by using uh, ignition improvers. Uh, and then you can have a fuel that is 95% uh, alcohols and run it in a diesel engine. Uh, you can also use uh, the alcohols uh, as such, with some, some uh, petrol in it, and use it in uh, engines that run on the uh, auto cycle as well. Um, you also have some uh, really interesting uh, engine concepts where you basically try to uh, mix the good thing about uh, uh, auto engines, that you uh, inject the fuel early, you have low emissions of particles and so on, uh, with the good uh, properties of the uh, diesel engine, that you have compression ignition and can get very high uh, efficiencies. Uh, these uh, concepts are not uh, yet commercial, but could be in the foreseeable future. Uh, and we also have uh, fuel cells. <coughs> um, so one important factor is how we handle um, the fuels practically uh, uh, in the within the agricultural forestry and so on. Uh, and as you know, uh, uh, alcohols uh, can be toxic if you uh, consume that. Uh, that's not really anything uh, that makes them that special if we are talking about fuels. In general, you should not uh, consume them. Uh, and their general toxic aspects are uh, quite similar but different to, to the ones of uh, fossil fuels. Um, if we, uh, for example, have a, a spill or something like that, uh, then the uh, ecotoxic uh, aspects are important. Uh, and then we have an advantage with the uh, alcohols that they, uh, they, they compose uh, quite rapidly and in general um, they are not that toxic to um, elements and, and plants and, and so on. Uh, now, if we use uh, alcohols within one uh, these sectors, uh, we have one advantage with alcohols is that we, uh, as a society, uh, know about a lot about how they work. We use them quite a lot, uh, but uh, on an individual basis, uh, people using the fuels and so on, uh, what they are used to is is diesel, and. If we introduce uh, alcohols, 
they will have different um, properties in, in various regards, with regards to uh, fire safety, with regards to materials they can work with, and, and so on. And uh, um, it is therefore important that we have a uh, an efficient spread of knowledge so that uh, when people use alcohols, they are, know what they are actually using and not assuming that it works the same way as with uh, diesels, because th then we can have a dangerous uh, situation. Uh, if we look at uh, how well the different type of uh, uses and powertrains uh, match what we are after uh, and what kind of efficiencies uh, we can get. Uh, we have a situation where uh, some uh, uh, machinery, so like uh, tractors, sorry, uh, which tractors, uh, which sorry, use uh, uh, run often quite. Uh, in a, a static manner. You run the engine and you uh, do not change how much uh, power you want to get out uh, that much. Uh, and for those uh, applications, uh, you have some uh, powertrains which are not really that flexible. So, for example, uh, high energy, uh, high temperature fuel cells and some of these new engine concepts. Uh, they, it, they are not that good at handling variation in power, uh, but you can get very high efficiencies, and so that's kind of a nice mix. Uh, for some other applications, so for example, weed loaders, uh, harvesters, you have a quite a lot of variation in the power that you want to get out. Uh, for example, with a weed loader, you can run f forward, back foot, uh, lift material, empty material, and during that process that is fairly quick, you have a lot of variation in the, in the power that you want to take out. Uh, and then you need powertrains that are able to, to handle these kind of variations. Uh, you could also, in some cases, think of a, f uh, a future uh, where we have, for example, more uh, electrification. And then we can have um, use these more kind of uh, static powertrains uh, to uh, use them as generators at uh, locally. For example, if we have uh, in forestry, uh, we can take that with us uh, to where we run the machine, and then that one can produce electricity uh, that we then feed to batteries in, in the vehicles. Uh, in terms of uh, fuel distribution and so on, uh, they vary a little bit between the different uh, sectors. Uh, so in forestry, what you typically do is that you uh, have a fairly smallish tank that you fuel at a, a fuel station and then you bring it to the forest. Whilst in the agricultural and construction sectors, you have uh, your own tanks and then you have the uh, the uh, fuel distributor that bring the fuel to your tank and then you use your fuel from there. And then you have much bigger tanks. Uh, they look uh, something like this. Uh, <coughs> uh, one important factor in that case, is of course, if you will have uh, enough energy in the fuel to be able to do to use use your current practices, uh, and then in that case, of course, the most tricky case will be if you have uh, if you're bringing your fuel with you, uh, and in that case, in the uh, typical scenario, we will have uh, enough to do that. We can imagine trickier cases, but then, uh, because you typically run a two-shift operation in, in forestry, uh, you can have uh, both people uh, bringing the fuel, and then you would have twice the capacity, so you could handle such a situation. Uh, 
in terms of the cost of this operation, uh, they are very much linked to how much fuel you use uh, during a year. Uh, so it will be a bit tricky for agriculture, of course, then you do not uh, use as much fuel during the year, and then the, the supply chain will be um, harder to, to finance. Uh, but in the other sectors, we are not really adding that much to the, to the cost of the fuel. Uh, so our main conclusions so far, it's an ongoing project, uh, is that we are using uh, chemicals that is uh, well known, uh, but that we have to uh, handle this situation when they're new, used in a new context and not everyone know how to, to use them in, in that context. Um, we also have... Um, uh, I haven't talked about fires, but uh, fire uh, is an area where, where they differ in, in properties. Uh, in, the, in that regard, if you have a vehicle fire, then you typically have an uh, advantage. Uh, it's easier to control, but on the hand, there are bigger uh, fires, so if you have a tank station and so on, it can be, can be more tricky. Uh, and overall, uh, we uh, expect the uh, conditions for, for use of alcohols to be likely to be best in forestry, because then we have the highest usage and we have the highest capacity to handle what extra costs we have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So the floor is open for one, okay, two short questions. Yes, the first here, a lady. Hi, Joanne Ellis from SSPA in Gothenburg. I had a question about the environmental benefit. You maybe didn't have a chance to cover yeah, that, but yeah. you compared it with HVO and uh, diesel, is that correct? So did they yeah. had an improvement compared to those, but amongst the alcohols they were similar in environmental benefit? And um, so, I mean, uh, um, um, currently, we are doing some regulations of, of that data. Uh, what typically you have is that you have uh, you have a domination of two factors of the the fossil intensity of the production process and the thermal efficiency of the engine. Uh, and then, of course, it depends on. Uh, what kind of production process you have. I mean, it's that not something that is specific for, for these sectors. Um, and for the uh, applications, you have... Uh, you can have some variation in, in how efficient they are in, uh, in engines, but I would say that you have more variation in the type of engines you have rather than the, the fuel. Yes, hello. Short question. Andrea Sirklund from Ekopar AB. Uh, the dual fuel concept, it depends on how you do it, but uh, methanol you can put into the uh, air charger of the engine. So you have compressed air that is warm, you inject methanol and it becomes a vapor and it goes into the engine. Or how do you plan to do the dual fuel technology? Uh, so in, in the dual fuel you start with uh, the diesel uh, and then Diesel would work as uh, igniters of the fuel, yes. Yes. Uh, and then you would use the, the alcohols. I'm not sure if I understood your question. Now, the, there's different designs of dual fuel. You can inject the methanol or ethanol as a liquid directly into the engine, or you can bleed it in, so to say, with the air going into the engine. Ah, okay, okay. Um, I think... Uh, the values we have used is when you uh, inject it with the air, but I, I'm, I'm not short and certain, I shouldn't really tell. You don't know? <laughs> I, uh, I, th I think we can discuss it in the yeah. lunch break uh, because we have to move on. Thank you very much, uh, Gunnar, Thank for you. being here. Please.
Thank you. And our next speaker uh, is going to be Olga Shapoval from NMBU. And she's going to talk about uh, uh, oligonous fungi and how to exploit them uh, to produce microbial oil and uh, biopolymers. Olga, the floor is yours. to say that at NMBU we are working um, for high and low value microbial lipids, so high value that's of course food feed applications and uh, pharmaceutical applications and low, um, and low value lipids, that's, that's the biofuels. So um, shortly about the outline of my talk, so I, I will at, um, Okay, oh. <laughs> much better. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I will give a short overview about uh, what's the status with the lipid feedstock for the lipid-based biofuels and where is the microbial um, oils right now. And, uh, then I will uh, present uh, sh uh, shortly about microbial lipids and what's the sustainability challenge and talk about the co-production uh, biorefinery concept here. So uh, that's the, um, uh, that's the um, very shortly about uh, the availability of the different um, um, uh, lipid feedstocks. So uh, of course th uh, that's, no, uh, that's not the, um, the complete list, but it's just the main, uh, main uh, available feedstocks. So um, um, as you can see, so we have um, edible plant oils, which is very difficult to utilize right now uh, for the biofuels applications. Then we have um, non-edible plant oils which are also on the way to be developed. And then we have uh, cooking oils and animal fats, which are, um, uh, could be maybe considered as the most sustainable um, lipid feedstock now. And, uh, and then we have uh, microbial lipids, uh, also as, a, um, as an alternative potential feedstock for the lipid-based biofuels. So of course, uh, if you look at the, um, uh, at the price, so uh, microbial lipids, um, they are the most expensive um, per today um, lipid um, feedstock. But um, if we look what the situation going on now around um, the most sustainable today and the cheapest uh, feedstock, cooking oils and, uh, and, and animal fats, so we will see uh, that there is a definite competition for this feedstock because of there is a growing uh, bioplastic production industry which is starting to utilize this feedstock for the bioplastic production. And uh, uh, when it comes to the animal fat rest materials, uh, the industry who is owning or who is producing these rest materials, they're also looking for the uh, higher value uh, uh, um, uh, processes for utilizing these rest materials. One example we have actually in Norway Biorefinery company Norilia, they are um, uh, owning and um, trying to find a way for um, uh, for um, uh, valorizing about uh, 30,000 ton annually they have of animal um, rest materials, and they are not actually happy to use it for the biofuel production. So they want to find the ways for the higher value processes, as for example producing a biomass for the feed or food applications or uh, producing biosurfactants. So um, currently they have um, ongoing project um, um, activities for uh, bringing these animal rest materials to the higher value. So uh, what the situation could be uh, with the cooking oil and the animal fat um, rest materials that uh, as soon as other um, food sectors will find a way to, uh, to earn money more money uh, out of these uh, feedstocks, so suddenly uh, there could be um, uh, a limited um, availability for the biofuels. So um, that's why we believe that uh, microbial lipids, that's actually an uh, alternative feedstock which has to be developed further to be more cheaper and more competitive with other lipid-based um, feedstocks. So what are the microbial lipids? So that's the 
That's the lipids which are produced by the microorganisms, and uh, uh, there's a special group of microorganisms which are able to uh, accumulate from 20 to um, uh, up to 80 percent of the um, of their total biomass in the form of lipids. So here we have. Um, algae yeast and filamentous fungi and we can produce it by the heterotrophic process by using uh, sugar rich substrates or by the phototrophic process by utilizing um, light uh, and, um, and the CO2. So uh, um, the key um, uh, 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 condition for the um, um, lipid production in, um, in microbial cells will be the high excess of the carbon and um, a low nitrogen sources. Um, the microbial lipids profile, that's uh, three acylglycerides, uh, and uh, the fatty acid profile is very similar, and in some cases it's identical to the plant oils. And um, per today, there is industrial production uh, of, um, uh, of microbial lipids, which is done by the DCM in Netherlands. They are producing high-value lipids by utilizing oleaginous fungi. Uh, for today, there is no industrial production available for the production of low-value um, uh, low lipids uh, for the um, uh, biofuels application. So, uh, the, sustainability, uh, the sustainability challenge, of course, is a price because if we want to produce microbial lipids for, for the fuel um, um, applications, we need to uh, utilize sugar-rich uh, substrate from the lignocellulose materials and produce it through the biochemical process. So, uh, two years ago, there have been um, uh, published quite uh, interesting review publication about um, uh, the lipid-rich um, um, uh, um, feedstocks for the lipid-based biofuels, and um, uh, uh, there was a very interesting diagram in this review where they have place different feedstocks based on the effective hydrogen uh, to carbon. Um, um, ratio and uh, the biochemical feedstocks, um, which is um, the lipids produced through the biochemical way. So of course they have a very low hydro um, hydrogen carbon uh, effective ratio, and they would need more uh, insights uh, um, 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 of hydrogen to be uh, actually um, uh, economically sustainable. So it means that if we want to produce microbial lipids as a single product in this process we are really not sustainable. So we would need to develop a biorefinery bi concept where we have uh, the lipids for the, um, for the biofuels as a byproduct and we would need to have a high value product as a main product. So um, uh, we are working at, at, at NMBU a lot with allogeneous filamentous fungi, um, optimizing for different type of lipids, different applications and um, we started to look what else in addition to lipids we can produce with this organism and what we see that, that this organism uh, can um, accumulate quite a lot biopolymer, um, biopolymer hitosan. So um, the lipids are usually located inside the cells in the special organelles, lipid, um, um, lipid droplets, and the hitosan is located uh, in the cell wall, which is the um, outer part of the cell. So... Um, uh, um, in the cell wall, um, we usually uh, have uh, a different components, but the heat zone could take quite a big part of the cell wall. When we are producing um, microbial lipid-rich biomass, so we are extracting lipids, pressing out, and the cell wall, that's the, that's the rest material. So you have basically two products, lipids and the cell wall, which is um, rich in heat zone if you, if you optimize the process. So um, the hitosan, actually, if you look at the hitosan, um, that's a, uh, that's a high-value bio, um, biopolymer which has a really wide range of applications. And if you look at the market, the market of hitosan production uh, in Europe is growing. And uh, um, per today, uh, the main source of the hitosan is shrimps. And in shrimps, you don't have a pure hitosan. You have a heating which has to be... Um, 
uh, processed further to the heat ozone, while filamentous fungi are actually the only natural source of the pure heat ozone. And um, in, uh, in Europe right now, uh, as well as in Norway, there is a set of the companies which are uh, popping up, which are uh, specifically interested in the fungal heat ozone and setting up the production of the, um, of the fungal heat ozone. Uh, the highly uh, the, um, the, uh, fungal heat ozone, uh, due to its high uh, purity, it uh, specifically um, has applications in, um, um, in a high value um, areas, as for example, biomedical and pharmaceutical applications. So, um, I've been asked to make as general as possible uh, presentation, but uh, still it's a research. <laughs> so, uh, I have one slide which is related um, uh, to some research results and uh, to show you why actually uh, by using lignocellulose um, um, sugars we will be able uh, to develop this concept. So um, in the lignocellulose hydrolysates um, we have a glucose which is a main carbon source um, for fungi and will be a main carbon source for producing lipids and um, and the hitosan. Also we have an acetate. So um, uh, the key molecule for the production of lipids, as well as hitosan, is acetylconzyme A. So you want to have uh, this molecule as um, in high concentration as possible, and uh, uh, and the source of um, uh, uh, of getting this molecule is a glucose, is uh, is also acetate. So. Um, uh, to produce a hitosan, we need just the glucose. So, uh, so the lignocellulose hydrolysates they have in basically two substrates, which could um, uh, uh, could uh, could provide enough amount of uh, acetylconzyme molecule to produce both products, hitosan and the lipids. In addition, by uh, um, uh, due to them. Fungi having quite versatile uh, metabolism, they can utilize many substrates and we can combine different substrates. So we can combine uh, other substrates which could increase concentration of acetylconzyme A, like a, like a glycerol or, um, or the fat substrate. So um, uh, the co-production concept could be developed um, uh, in quite relatively easy way, so we need just to adjust the substrate composition. Here you see two different conditions where you have a lot of lipids and a little bit of hitosan. Here you have a lot of hitosan and, um, uh, um, and reduced amount of lipids. So we can manipulate with the substrate to achieve both products. And also we are testing, of course, we are working with different type of industries which are um, uh, uh, producing li li lignocellulose um, hydrolysates, and what we see that on some hydrolysate after um, optimization, uh, we can have much higher biomass yield and much higher lipid yields than on the control conditions, which is a standard lab synthetic medium. So, and then uh, I'm almost finished, so <laughs> two slides left. So, uh, so our research is involved in biofuels um, uh, project. We also got um, uh, this year funded a new project specifically for developing co-production concept with, um, with, the um, with the German partners. And just uh, um, shortly some conclusions. Uh, so uh, uh, we have to look at microbial lipids as a potential lipid feedstock, and, uh, but it's, uh, it should be as a biorefinery concept with the co-production of, um, of the higher value products. So thank you for your attention. And I would like to thank you, uh, the Biofuels team at NMBU and our research group, uh, Biospec Norway at NMBU. Yeah. Thank you, Aga. And there is time for one short question, if there is one in the audience. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Actually, I have many questions, but I'll start with one of them. Uh, what is Shitosan used for? Yeah, so, okay, uh, it's, uh, it has a wide range. Uh, it's used in the water treatment applications. It's used in, med uh, in medical applications for uh, wound healing products. It's used in feed. It's used in, um, also in food uh, as, um, as additives. So, the, uh, so there is uh, a really wide range of the applications. And they need different type of applications would need a different purity of the hitosan. When you feed uh, microorganisms with uh, sugar and they make fats and shit shitosan, 
Uh, what would the price of that fat be? And is it regarded as uh, a virgin thing or, or a byproduct or as a waste? Uh, and the Hytosan as a main product? Yeah, uh, yes, because the price of the Hytosan will be much higher than the price of the lipid, uh, of the biofuel, uh, the, the lipids for the biofuel. So then the Hytosan would be, uh, oh, I mean, we didn't do uh, any, uh, any calculations, but there will be a need to find a balance, how to make actually microbial lipids cheaper than they are now. All right, thank okay. you very much, Waga. Don't run off, don't run off. Waga, don't run off, <laughs> thank you. Um, and uh, so it, it, uh, this session is uh, a really important one uh, when we talk about uh, when we think about biofuels because uh, as Goodmund uh, also emphasized that we have to think about how to use uh, uh, biomass as that's uh, the only uh, energy renewable energy source that is uh, carbon based and we can use it as materials and um, but uh, right now, uh, we are going to divert uh, from the biorefinery perspective and how to use uh, uh, carbon for alternative materials. And we will go back to a systems perspective. And uh, Miriam Röder uh, from Aston University is going to talk about uh, the role and impact of bioenergy on sustainability. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm taking you back to kind of like a more high-level perspective, and it's quite interesting. So I, I'm tempted to actually lock the door so no one is leaving the room because I'm actually a sociologist. So the things which have been told here at the moment were very interesting for me because that is absolutely not my area of expertise. So I now take you to the adventure to actually listen to me while you were quite interested in the really technical um, and chemical stuff. Um, so I'm going to talk about... Uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable bioenergy within net zero emission targets, because that is kind of like the new flavor of the season. Um, the UK was one of the first countries, if not the first country, which actually implemented uh, a law to reach net zero emissions by 2050. What does it mean? So everybody talks about net zero, but what actually is it? We know we have a carbon budget available to stay within a certain climate change target. And because we're not doing very well, actually, to reduce our emissions and to stay in these targets, uh, we need negative emissions. So what we have at the moment, we have a lot of emissions going into the atmosphere. We want to reach net zero. That means we need negative emissions to actually reach net zero. At some point, we actually need to reach net negative emissions, which is even harder, which is just that bit. And as long as we emit, we need to actually get that carbon and these emissions out of the atmosphere as well. And that is not an easy job, as we already struggle to actually reduce our emissions. So net zero actually is an offset of emissions. And that means we have real emissions would need to be offset by negative emissions. And it comes with all the challenges and uncertainties and risks of offsetting. What does it mean in terms of bioenergy? What is the role of bioenergy in such a net zero target? Um, bioenergy is the only renewable energy which actually can sequester CO2 out of the atmosphere. So that means um, bioenergy has a potential of negative emissions, but does it really have that? And that means if we want to be zero ne um, negative emissions with bioenergy, we kind of also need CCS with that. We not just need to sequester the carbon out of the atmosphere, because if we then turn it into energy, we release some of the carbon again, that carbon needs to be locked away. So to really reach negative emissions, we need bioenergy with CCS bags. At the moment, people, if they think about bioenergy, they think about emission reductions. But if we start to talk about negative emissions, we actually need to move away from just removing, uh, uh, reducing emissions. We need to think, start thinking in a cumulative budget that we need to remove carbon from the atmosphere, that we need to store that carbon we have removed in one form or the other, can also be in form of products, obviously. And that means we need to manage carbon stocks. So it's not anymore just reducing emissions. We need to manage these carbon stocks, biomass is able to sequester out of the atmosphere. Obviously, there are challenges to it, because to get as many negative emissions as possible, we need to maximize it. So we may need to make sure the biomass carbon is locked away in one form or the other. If it's bioenergy, it probably is around CCS. Um, 
there are many challenges around the accounting and reporting of carbon and international supply chains. So the question is who actually gets what credit in terms of when we talk about net negative, where does it happen? There's a time difference between carbon sequestration and actual carbon storage. So, and that means when does accounting for negative emissions actually start? At what point of time? When we start growing the biomass, when we start taking the biomass to do something with that? And there's a challenge around traceability of carbon. Because, for example, in the UK, a lot of bioenergy is about using waste and residue materials. If you have processed materials, if you have waste, it's very hard to actually trace the carbon in that feedstock. How do you actually account for it? Because we would just, cons at the moment, the frameworks for accounting for it, you consider it as carbon neutral, which is not. Because as soon as you would convert it into energy, you release CO2. So how do you account for such supply chains? And then the question obviously is about the type and the mix of bioenergy, because we have all these different technologies, and that's why I would say we're not having a boulevard of was it broken dreams, we actually have a boulevard of diversity with bioenergy. And so what does the future mix of technologies, applications, scale, cost, carbon efficiency of bioenergy actually look like? And then obviously there are a lot of interfaces beyond carbon, wider sustainability implications of bioenergy we need to consider. But let's start with the carbon because we want to be net zero. So what a lot of um, kind of like accounting systems for carbon are at the moment, they're looking at carbon at a point of time. We do life cycle assessment. And we have done some life cycle assessment, so I pulled up an example to explain the process, we, how we need to actually change the methodology of accounting. Um, we have done life cycle assessments, for example, on forest, um, using forest residues to produce electricity, what is quite common in the UK. And if we look at it, and we look at different forest management regimes, we can see, and that is the current uh, emission intensity of the UK electricity grid, we get carbon reductions. Great. It's possible to reduce carbon. If we want to talk about net zero, and we need to start thinking in a carbon budget, we need to start thinking about the whole system. Because at the moment, we account for the life cycle emissions, but now we need to include the, uh, the biogenic carbon in our products. So that means we need to consider the whole forest because the forest is not grown for bioenergy. The forest is grown for all kinds of products. It's a bit like a biorefinery. So yeah, you're in the right session. <laughs> and so we have all these different products in a forest which sequester carbon when the forest grows and they're used for different things. They're used for high quality furniture maybe. Uh, they're used for pulp and paper. Um, they're used for bioenergy. And all these products have different lifetimes. So carbon is stored for a different length in, in the system, but at some point the carbon will be re-released. So we really need to understand the whole forest when we look into bioenergy, if we're interested, for example, in forest residues, and we need to understand how much carbon is for how long actually stored in the products and at what point in time is it released. So it's not just about yeah, carbon reductions, but we need to understand the whole system which changes the picture quite a lot. So this was then some work we did considering not just an LCA, but considering the whole carbon balance of a forest with bioenergy. And we were interested what that actually means in terms of cumulative emissions, not just emissions at the point in time. And what was quite interesting, so what is above above the zero means we have a positive carbon stock, so we're actually accumulating carbon from the atmosphere with the forest system. Everything beneath it means we have a carbon, we, we lose carbon from the system. And it's different forest management systems. That's why we have all these different curves. And that one's actually on the secondary line, so that was positive as well. So we actually had more, kept more carbon in the system. And the forest systems where we kept more carbon in the systems where the forest, and it's not too surprising actually, uh, with long rotations where we also had a really large share of high quality forest products which had a very long lifetime. So for very long actually stored the carbon. We didn't include CCS at this research. So from the UK perspective, we are interested in energy because there's this forest growing, it gives us residues to produce pellets, to bring them to the UK and produce electricity. So 
the, the focus there is, I want to replace the current electricity with bioenergy. What does it mean for the energy system? And we could achieve emission reductions, and we also could achieve negative emissions for these two forest management systems, but not for these. However, it's not just the UK which wants to have bioenergy. It's actually the foresters in the countries which produce the forest who are interested what can they do with their products, and they might also be interested what is the carbon balance of my forest when I do these different types of forest baskets. And then we were interested, what actually happens if, a for, if you, from a forester perspective, considers, well, what does it mean for my carbon balance in the forest when I'm not doing bioenergy? Does bioenergy really help me to improve the carbon balance of my whole forest? And this is what happened. Just including, kind of like leaving a feedstock maybe on the ground or doing bioenergy, it meant that actually the system, through bioenergy, lost carbon and was, was positive before here, was negative here. So the system through bioenergy lost carbon, and also in that system, but that was still positive. So that system actually still accumulated carbon in the system. So we had kind of like negative emissions. So it's really important, therefore, to understand the wider system and to understand the cross-sectoral consequences. So it's not just one sector using something specific from the biomass source. You have to understand how it's across the sectors and you need to understand how much carbon is stored and released. And we saw that it's possible to actually remove carbon from the atmosphere also if bioenergy is included, but you really have to make sure that this is given and you can't take for granted just because you do buy energy, it's carbon neutral or it's storing carbon in the system. And then obviously there are accounting frameworks and accounting systems, which makes it really difficult to identify what are negative emissions. Where does accounting start? Because at the moment accounting frameworks are, this is a forest nation growing the forest, so there's a lot of carbon sequestered from the atmosphere, so they're getting the brownie points for having carbon sequestration by growing a forest. However, they manage a forest, so there's harvesting and reforesting, which comes with emissions. Then we have shipping. We heard masks this morning. They're shipping emissions, and at the moment they're, they're registered, but they're not accounted, they're not allocated to any country because they're happening in international waters. And then we have the emissions in, in the country where we do buy energy, and that's with all the supply chain emissions, that's what we include in LCAs. But then obviously we have the biogenic carbon, which is released back to the atmosphere, and that is currently just recorded in a, in a memorandum, so that's not kind of like accounted for. And if we had CCS, we would store that carbon, that biogenic carbon, we look at, lock it away, we would store it. But there's no existing accounting and reporting framework for CCS at the moment. So we have plans, we have legislation for negative emissions, but we're actually not having the policy frameworks how to account for it and how to make it fair. This is the UK territorial emissions down here. So that is the annual emissions of the UK uh, in the last 40 years, almost 50 years. And this is what the UK reports. So these are these bits of emissions. And I have another graph down here. So that is the territorial emissions in, in the last, actually the cumulative emissions in the last, uh, from 2028 20, to 2012. And because we have carbon budgets and um, 2013 to 2017. But then I included the blue line, which are actually the consumption-based emissions. So that would be, if you include, if you allocate the emissions the UK is causing by importing a product, in that case, by energy, and that is much higher, obviously, than the, than, the, than the territorial emissions, because the UK imports a lot of products. And that means, if that grey one here is the carbon budget, that the consumption-based emissions actually are much higher than the UK carbon budget is allocated. And there are a lot of questions around that in terms of how it's accounted for, because it's very no, no, it's not very easy for the UK to become net zero with the cur current territorial emissions. But then if you allocate it, the emissions actually causing internationally, that's going to be even harder. And as I said before, 
bioenergy and sustainability, especially sustainability, obviously is beyond carbon. And you have to understand the synergies and trade-offs of what you actually do within your bioenergy system. And I mean, we're here in the Nordic countries, sustainability was invented in Norway, kind of, <laughs> I would say. Or Norway was one of the leading nations to, to push it. And so, and there are all these societal and economic aspects around, around sustainability. So it's not just about carbon. And then the question is, what is the main driver actually of bioenergy? We call it energy, but we not necessarily only do it for energy. We might do it for waste management. We might do it for to, to improve agricultural sectors. We might do it to give foresters an additional income by utilizing uh, uh, the, the residues. Um, there might be cross-sectoral um, interactions. We talked about biorefineries. You have all these kind of different markets and totally different sectors. Um, there are spatial implications. Where does what happen along the bioenergy supply chain, which becomes even more complicated when it's international supply chains. And you have the temporal implications. And that means if we change something in, in the system, and here it's kind of like just an example of different business models we looked into for bioenergy systems. If you change something in the system, it changes something else. And Patricia showed it yesterday. Uh, you always, if you have positive impacts, you often have at some point also negative impacts. And you need to understand these trade-offs. And then we have people. So who are actually the beneficiaries of bioenergy? For whom are we doing it? Who will have a gain from a bioenergy, biorefinery, biomaterial system, and there might be people who actually have a negative impact from it. There might be the losers, and we have to be aware of what is happening in the whole system. And so we have to also understand the impacts and trade-offs for the different actors, and maximizing the environmental benefits might compromise on social and economic benefits, because it might affect different groups differently. So it's really important that we um, that we understand what the priorities and the sustainability objectives of bioenergy business models are. Is it just carbon? Is it around climate change? Or is it about energy security? Is it about cost? Is it about fairness and, and uh, energy justice? So the key messages are net carbon reductions can be achieved, and especially when we compare to conventional fuels, but not necessarily if we compare to low carbon energy, because we decarbonize the energy sector already. And a lot is related also to forest and crop management, and we have to understand what does bioenergy actually do to current systems if we change something. Um, there are a lot of non-energy related aspects and factors that play a role. And um, there are a lot of challenges around emission, uh, emission accounting and reporting frameworks, especially for international and cross-sectoral supply chains. And that shows that the system approach is necessary to capture all the relevant impacts and system dynamics. And sustainability across the whole supply chain process is key if we want to generate and maximize the benefits. And that means enabling positive benefits and mitigating negative benefits means we need to understand these interfaces between the different aspects of a system. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Miriam. And thank you for not locking the door, because then uh, the others from the other room could <laughs> yeah, come back true. and join us for the closing And remarks. health and safety. Yeah, yeah. Don't trust <laughs> me with health and safety. <laughs> yeah. um, are there any questions uh, for Miriam? Yes? A microphone? Yes. Uh, from here. Uh, when it comes to negative carbon, uh, it can be, yeah, as you mentioned, quite, quite hard to uh, mm -hmm. quantify. Um, what, do we have any comments on like what is good enough uh, idea about how much you save and so on? <coughs> well, I mean, you need to. You need obviously how much you save is important, but you need to to get negative, and you're not just by just doing bioenergy, you're not getting negative. Full stop. Because bioenergy is not even carbon neutral because you have supply chain emissions and you have the temporal differences. So um, then. In, in terms of, of the UK, for example, negative emissions need CCS. There's another talk next door about um, negative emissions actually at the same time. Um, for Scandinavia, it's totally different because you have forests, so there can be a, a lot done through afforestation. So you need to look at the kind of like the national carbon 
the carbon budget. If, well, you actually need to look at the global carbon budget, but you can't reforest the whole planet to offset our emissions. I think the key really is what we need is emission reductions. If we reduce emissions according to climate, to, to stay within climate change budgets, the more we reduce, the less negative we need. So it's, it, makes, it makes the whole thing just more complicated because we're not able to reduce enough. So it will be even harder to then bring in kind of like alternatives to, to make it negative. So my, my answer would be emission reductions, full stop. Get, get the emissions cut, which obviously is not easy. And I'm not having an answer to how to do that, <laughs> in case someone wants to ask. <laughs> Uh, Miriam, I was wondering, uh, mm -hmm. what are the current technologies for uh, carbon capture? Like what uh, you're familiar with, and, and uh, yeah. do you have? Uh, would you uh, suggest one over the other? Or N no, it's like so bioenergy. Uh, what are the options of bioenergy, yeah. and what is the best one? Or was that? It's it's a whole it's a whole mix and different applications. Um, I mean, that's it's it's a bit the scary thing because CCS, it's not really kind of like really kind of like commercial or BEX. It's not commercial and at a scale where we actually need it. And uh, there are technologies and especially in the fossil fuel industry, uh, CCS is used to remove carbon along supply chain activities or to store carbon. Norway had a facility with CCS which was shut down because it was not economic. And um, there are different technologies and there's a lot of, I know in Sharmas they do chemical looping, which I totally don't understand because I'm not an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's, it's really to see how it fits with the context and also the scale. So for the UK, Drax Power Station is looking into CCS because it's a large scale, it's very easy, you do combustion and you, after the combustion you capture it with a solvent or a sorbent and then you lock it away and it's very kind of like straightforward supply chain. But if you have a lot of kind of like more medium scattered small scale systems, how do you capture the carbon? How do you bring it to your reservoir? How do you Storage. So there's a lot of challenges around it. We look into it. There's a lot of research going on in the UK around this, um, but answers have to be found. And but it's no it's no excuse to not look into it. <laughs> That's why we're researchers and stay in the job because <laughs> there's so many questions. <laughs> yeah, there are more and more doors that open. <laughs> yeah, that we have to enter and find solutions. Yeah, and I mean there are also technologies yeah. about mm -hmm. air direct air capture or weathering or so there's a lot of kind of like greenhouse gas removal technologies, but. I think if we would need re reduce the reductions, if we would get there, then yeah. uh, we would need to less worry mm. about weird technologies. All right, then uh, we are right on time. Uh, please uh, uh, join me in thanking Miriam and okay. also all mm -hmm. the speakers of this session. Please access some chocolates. And uh, there are some people entering the room, so I think uh, the parallel session just uh, finished. And if uh, Anders is here around, then uh, I would hand over the microphone. Yeah? Oh, thank you. <laughs>